Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. If you had known that the year 2020 was going to be so weird, would you have done anything different to prepare for it? How might you have changed the patterns of your life to get yourself ready for all of the things that we are going through? Of course, we're in the era of infectious disease, which has dramatically impacted our lives and the patterns that we're familiar with. It's impacted our economy and our personal financial security. We have a lot of new habits to learn, and there's no real end in sight. We are experiencing social unrest and upheaval in big ways. A lot of it is based on racial inequality, and I agree that there are many things that need to be done but neither can we undo what's already been done because we can't change history. <clears throat> We're seeing an increase of violence and a decrease in decency. Our political scene is more perplexing than ever and our elected officials at every level seem to thrive on conflict and attack and pointing out how awful the other guy is. And the people that report all these things to us are less and less trustworthy. It seems that we're kind of getting ripped apart at the seams. There's much uncertainty. And we ask, what's, what's going to happen to us in our lives? What's going to happen to our children? And our children's children and their children after that? And will there be a world worth living in if we continue on these courses that are so destructive? My friends, this weirdness ought not to surprise us in the least. Because if you know what the book says, we, would, we have been prepared for it. It's all in here. Here are the words of the, uh, the Apostle Paul when he wrote to his friend Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people, turn away. It's the world we live in, my friends. And based on what we know from the scriptures, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Don't let it surprise us. This is our reality. And rather than ask what we might have done differently, the question perhaps we should ask is, how do we live now? What shall we do to be able to survive and to overcome and perhaps even thrive and fulfill our calling as the people of God, to live in peace, to live in strength, and to live in hope in the middle of all this craziness. We face the world. We face the challenge of a harsh and hostile environment. We have such ambiguous circumstances. And we take Personally, we take a few shots and a few criticisms and attacks and we struggle to know how to live in order to protect ourselves and our loved ones from the hurt and pain that seems to be swirling around. So that takes us to our focal passage in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, where the Apostle Paul talks about armoring ourselves by putting on the armor of God. Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10, would you stand, please, that we would honor the reading of God's holy word. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Almighty God, help us to see your truth. This day, help us to be prepared for the world as it is, Lord. Let us be armored by your love, that we would be strengthened, that we would be equipped, that we would go forth in great victory for your sake. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And be seated, please. When police officers go out on routine patrol... They wear ballistic armor, a bullet-resistant vest, body armor. Same for our soldiers and Marines and airmen and sailors in places like uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever they go. When you know you're going into a hostile environment, you protect yourself by wearing the right equipment. And I know that we always want to look on the bright side of life. We want to hope for the best things, and we have great confidence that one day it's all going to be smoothed out, everything's going to be fine and dandy. But we still are living in a broken world. And we must never forget, 1 Peter 5, that your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. And we have got to be able to resist him steadfast, to be strong in our faith, to be able to overcome. Putting on the armor of God for our own protection enables our spirit and our psyche to thrive. Just in the same way a ballistics vest is physical protection for a police officer. And the armor of God enables us to resist, enables us to overcome, to face the world that is out to get us sometimes. Look at verse 12. There are, there are forces and enemies set against you. And they are real, and they are powerful, and they hate you, and they hate the fact that Christ lives in you. And the enemy wants more than anything to disrupt your faith, to disturb your peace, to generate conflict in you, in your family, in your workplace, and in your church. When my family and I moved from Hawaii to Lafayette, Louisiana, we got settled in, we began to find a church that we could kind of get connected to. One place we visited we went to an adult Sunday school class, and the, folk, the, the feller that was teaching the adult Sunday school class went on and on about how terrible the Methodists are and the Presbyterians and the Catholics and all the other kind of Christians that he didn't like so much and how they were so wrong. <laughs> and you know me, never miss up the opportunity to offend somebody. So I spoke up, and I said, you know, the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Catholics are not my enemy. The enemy is my enemy. The devil is my enemy. And Satan would like nothing more than to see the church turn against itself. You know, I make friends wherever I go. We didn't go back to that one. Let me put that in a different context, though. You don't have to answer this out loud. You ever had bad thoughts about your spouse? 
they do or say something perfectly innocent, but you have this surge of frustration or animosity or when you pick a fight for no good reason at all, and you can't even explain why that is. No. Where do you suppose that comes from? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Your spouse, your children, your parents, your co-workers, your church people, they are not your enemy. And the fight and frustration that we sometimes have with all those people, it's not because of those people. It's because the world is full of bitterness and hate and animosity, and the principalities and powers want to stir that up and create that conflict. And we have these challenges and obstacles that are trying to steal away our joy and our peace. We have three primary sources that we wrestle with. Powers and principality, Paul calls them. We wrestle with the world. The greed system, the get ahead, more money will make me happy, strive, achieve, live for attention and affirmation of all the people, come out on top of the heap. That's the world system that we wrestle against. We wrestle against the devil, who was a liar from the beginning, the accuser of the brethren, the embodiment of evil, the prince of this world, and he is actively opposed to you. And we wrestle against the flesh, the old self, who lives right here, who is out for number one, pleasure, satisfaction of the ego, pride, self. The devil, the world, the flesh. And two of those enemies are out there, and one of them is right here with me all the time. We need to be aware of the threat that they pose to us. We need to be prepared. We need to take active steps to prevent them from gaining a foothold so that we can stand, so that we can overcome. And to do that, we're going to armor up. We're going to use some armor to protect ourselves. And in verse 14, it says, Gird your waist with the truth. In ancient Rome, soldiers would wear a belt that they could hang equipment on, a wide belt, sword, knife, whatever. And that would be made of leather and sometimes with metal plates or scales to provide additional protection. And as time went on, it went from just a belt to almost a girdle, a big wide thing that would protect the waist and the hips and the groin area. So it would be like this, this tall. That's a belt. Now how does that relate to gird your waist with truth? Well... Grandma always said, if you always tell the truth, you never get caught in a lie. You are protected by the truth. If we live with a policy of truth and honesty in all circumstances on every occasion, then a lie will never cause us any harm at all. Lies are an awful way to hurt each other. Lies say, I don't trust you enough to be honest I don't trust you enough to tell you how it really is. Sometimes we lie to cover up our own sins and shortcomings. And if we deceive or betray or do wrong to another and then tell lies to cover it up, well, you might as well stick a sword in the belly. It hurts just as much. Rather that we should always live in the truth, pursue the truth, and let our behavior be so far above reproach that we'd never have to tell a story to cover it up. The breastplate of righteousness is similar. When you and I choose righteous living, above board, completely honest, living according to the principles of Christ, to love one another, to demonstrate grace, forgiveness, mercy, and hope, humility, all those things, to say no to sin and selfishness. We protect ourselves and our loved ones from the consequences of all that sin and all that pain because the wages of sin is always death. Death in the heart, death to relationships, death to our peace, 
death in our relationship with God. As the name indicates, a breastplate protects the upper chest. Sometimes they were made of metal or chain mail. Because if you take a javelin or a spear in the chest, well, that's never good, right? Now, what vital organ is here? The heart protects your heart. You protect your own heart by living in righteousness. Here I am, stumbling on my broken foot. Ow. I'm all right. Let me stretch that out. When we have sin in our own lives, we hurt ourselves and we hurt the people around us. Living in righteousness, wearing the breastplate of righteousness, protects us from the pain. Now listen, you know that there was a lot more going on in our faith than simply don't sin and be a better person. The point here with Jesus is not merely moral and clean living. It's about life and joy and knowing who we are in Christ. It's about experiencing the presence and the power of God in new and life-changing ways. Let me say, though, that God's laws, God's righteousness, God's principles for living, he gives them to us because they are the best for us. He gives them to us so that we would avoid all the hurt and the pain and we would have a few boundaries and quit killing ourselves. Yes, your sin is an offense to God. It's killing you. Stop it. Live in righteousness. Put on that breastplate of righteous living and protect your own life and your own heart from the damage of unrighteousness. Verse 15 talks about putting on the shoes of the gospel of the preparation of peace. A lot of the message in the book of Ephesians is how we walk in this world. It's about how we treat one another. It's about how we live. And when we're walking in the new shoes of the new self, as we walk through this world, we're walking as the hands and feet of Jesus on earth. And Jesus, wherever he walked, he brought peace with him. And he shared that peace with those that he encountered, and he demonstrated grace and acceptance and restoration. He is the Prince of Peace. And our high and holy calling is to be like him, to represent him, to do the things that he would have done. And we ought to carry his peace with us and share it wherever we walk. And verse 16 continues to take up the shield of faith. A Roman soldier would carry a small shield, usually in his left hand, so that the right hand would be free for an offensive weapon. And a shield is protection. And you could over the head or to the side one way or another and beat off the slings and arrows of the enemy. Likewise, our faith is a protection. And as long as we are trusting in the Lord, as long as we are putting our hope in him, keeping our focus on Christ, fixed on his plans for us, all shall be well. We'll be sustained. We will be preserved. It's the blood of Christ that covers us and strengthens us and cleanses us and assures our pardon and acceptance before the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as Faith's Hall of Fame. And it talks about all the great saints throughout the, uh, the Bible. Abraham and Moses and David and Gideon and all the rest. And we were reminded how they trusted in the Lord and how they overcome. And time and time again, they had great victory for the Lord. And then towards the end of the chapter in verse 35, it says that others got tortured, not accepting the deliverance that they might obtain the better resurrection. They had trials of mocking and scourging, of chains and imprisonment. And they were stoned and sawn in two and tempted and slain with the sword. Well, 
that's not very fun. And then in verse 39, all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. And we add in the word, they didn't receive the promise here on earth, but God provided something better. And the point is this, even when the difficulties come, even when the challenges are enormous and it doesn't end up the way we would choose for it end up, even when we suffer, even when the worst happens, if we hold fast to our faith in Christ, if we trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding, then God is going to be glorified and magnified through it, no matter what. And that's what the shield of faith is about. Take up your shield never put it down. Verse 17 talks about wearing the helmet of salvation. The last of our defensive weapons, the helmet of salvation. Now where do you wear a helmet? On your head. Protect your noggin, of course. We need to protect our mind. We need to protect our thoughts. We need to keep our our consciousness focused on the Lord himself. I do a fair amount of counseling, you know that, talking with people about the ups and downs and things that they're experiencing. And every now and again, somebody will tell me, I can't help the way I feel. And I always say to them, yes, you can. You can help the way you feel by helping the way you think. Change the way you think, it'll change the way you feel. And that's why Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report and virtuous and praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think these kind of thoughts. Purify your mind and get your attention focused on that which God is doing. Change your thinking, and it will change your feelings. And we wear the helmet of salvation to protect our mind by filling it with truth and virtue and praise. We're armoring up, covered from head to toe, a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness, a shield of faith, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel of peace. And all our defenses are in place, and we are so much more prepared to face the attacks of the enemy. But according to Sun Tzu and von Clausewitz and Vince Lombardi, the best defense is a good offense. And with all our defensive weapons, we are given two, just two, Weapons to use in our counterattack. Second part of verse 17 and verse 18. First is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And secondly is prayer. To pray, always praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Hebrews 4 tells us that the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God, my friends, is one of the best tools that you have. It reveals the nature and character and person of God. It is alive and vibrant. It breathes its life into us and into those who encounter it. It strengthens us. It breaks down the barriers of sin and pain and hopelessness. It teaches us who we truly are and how to live as we ought to be. It strengthens us and it gives us hope. Use the sword of the Spirit. And secondly, verse 18, the power of prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Praying without ceasing. Praying continually, praying with passion and brutal honesty with God and ourselves. Praying with a heartbreak, praying with tears, praying in the scriptures, 
conversing with God, talking with God, and he talks to us and learning how to hear his voice as he speaks. And we're encouraged and we're built up and we're changed. And we can go forth and change the world. Go on to verses 19 and 20. Paul talks a little bit about the strength and the power of his testimony and the ability to tell the gospel story. And of course, Paul's story is recorded in the book of Acts. It's recorded in the 13 books that he contributed to the New Testament. And we know Paul because of the legacy of his faith and the wisdom and grace that he shared with us. Paul's life told a great story. Paul's testimony was one of triumph. You too, my friends, will have a story to tell. In this world, we have a testimony of Jesus to share, that we would speak boldly, that we would have great strength as we share love and grace and healing. That utterance may be given to you and I the courage to proclaim Jesus Christ the one and only way and truth and life and that the kingdom of heaven would go a little bit further in our lifetime. If we allow ourselves to be broken by the world, we can't do that. If we protect ourselves, protect our soul and spirit by putting on that armor of God, will be strengthened and prepared and preserved to be able to go forward and share the gospel, live as a witness. And then one day, one day we'll all be able to sit down together and have a lifetime, a forever, to share the stories. And Jesus will be there with us. And he's going to ask us about our favorite parts and about the hard parts. And we can ask him why our story was so weird sometimes. And we might have an answer. And some of the stories will be about love and peace and joy. And some of them will be about sacrifice and suffering and spiritual warfare pain and courage, and all the stories are going to point to the greatness of God Almighty. Amen? Father God, we rejoice in you. We thank you and we praise you. Help us, O Lord, to be prepared for this world, to be equipped for this world. Help us, O God, that we would be strengthened to serve you and to honor you in all that we do. Bless us with your presence. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And as always, we're going to close our time together with a hymn of invitation. And I don't know what things you're dealing with today. I know the altar is a place to bring them, to lay our burdens down at the foot of the cross. And if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, I want to talk with you and counsel you and encourage you to submit yourself before him know what the power of God is all about. Let's stand together. If you have a need, meet me down front. God will be glorified. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.